Good morning to all of you. Welcome back to the Namaste Experience. I'm James Twyman, and I am here in New Jersey, and you can probably hear that my voice is a little bit better today. I'm getting over my cold, which I'm so happy about, because tomorrow I, I get to perform my St. Francis musical again, also on Saturday and Sunday. I will be able to sing, and one of the reasons I'm really excited about this chat today is because our dear friend Matthew Fox, who will be joining us in just a moment, Many of you know of his of his long history in the Dominican order. In fact, he reminded me that he was a Dominican, he, he can tell us, a few years longer than Thomas Aquinas. That's quite a while. And me being a Franciscan, St. Francis and St. Dominic were friends. They knew one another and had great respect for one another and started their orders right around the same time. So this is like two brothers or two cousins coming together. And I, you know, I wore my John Lennon Imagine shirt here on purpose this morning, because today we're going to imagine a new possibility, the possibility of harmony, peace, on a level that we can't even begin to imagine. Sometimes we have to work through some of the sticky issues and difficulties that present themselves so that we can move into that dynamic experience of peace. And I do want to begin by saying that we, we shy away from politics on, on this call. And there are many of you, I'm sure, who are leaning one way and some who might be leaning the other. And so we don't intend in any way to, uh, to make anyone wrong or to... Uh, to force anyone to change their opinion, but I would suggest that we be open. And and Matthew is one of those people who for so many years now, both in his religious life as a Dominican, now as an Episcopal priest like me, and uh, all the work that he's done for so long. Many of you may know that uh, in his earlier life, the rebel Matthew Fox had to be actually escorted out of of the Catholic Church, uh, because of his in, partly because of his insistence on focusing on original innocence, as opposed to original sin. Wow, that's a pretty confrontational thing to to focus on. But I'm sure Matthew will talk about that. And being here in the election cycle, he does have a lot of insight to offer us. And once again, not to sway us or to push us, but to give us the information that we need so that we can make the best decisions possible. So, Matthew, and if you guys could, could make sure that you get yourself muted, like Carolyn, I just muted you. When you come in, make sure you're muted. Okay, Matthew, good morning to you. Welcome to the Namaste Village morning call. Good morning, James, and thank you for being 21st century troubadour, uh, traveling from New Jersey to other places, singing of St. Francis, our brother. And thank you to your community for welcoming me. I remember, well, James reminded me the other day of the last time we were together, where Mirvai Starr was with me, and they were just about ready to lock James up <laughs> in his hermitage for for a year, but what turned out to be six months. And um, so it's good to be back. And uh, I appreciate the the support that the community obviously gives James and that James obviously uh, returns and uh, he loves you all very much. So um, I wanna correct one thing though. I, I don't talk about original innocence, it's original blessing that blew the roof off the Vatican, original blessing. Um, Yes, I remember now. I, I, I always think of that wonderful line from Pope Innocent and Brother Sun, Sister Moon, that we so often focus on original sin instead of original innocence. That's where oh, I messed it up. <laughs> you got it from, from the film, okay. <laughs> but uh, yes, and of course, blessing is a theological word for goodness. So another word would be original goodness, original grace, and it's pretty obvious in Francis's consciousness as well as mine that this universe of 13.8 billion years has brought forth this amazing planet we call home and uh with it so many marvelous creatures of which we are one of the most recent 
and uh, sometimes we're not as marvelous as we ought to be. And uh, so will we be, be talking about an archetype today that is the most important archetype in Christian tradition for talking about evil. And um, that archetype is the archetype of uh, the Antichrist. And the reason I wrote this book of um, the Antichrist and related to today's uh, politics is that um, I was in Orvieto, Italy in June. Uh, I was leading a workshop there uh, on Thomas Aquinas for a week because this is the 800th anniversary of Aquinas' birth. And he taught in Orvieto and he also wrote poetry in Orvieto. And um, so I was there, but I wandered into the cathedral, which is a beautiful cathedral. Some people have called the most beautiful cathedral in the world. I'd call the most beautiful I can't cathedral talk. in Italy. But, uh, and I was ushered in by a friend of mine who's Italian and is also an Episcopal priest, like James and myself. And um, he brought me to this large fresco inside a chapel, a big chapel inside the cathedral. And he didn't say anything about it. I just stood in front of the fresco and I stared at it. And my gut said, not my head, my gut said to me, it feels like Donald Trump. And um, sure enough, the title of it was The Antichrist. Now, Dennis, let's show the picture of the of that um, painting, that fresco. So it really impacted me and enough that um, I went home and in July started a book and it's the fastest book I've ever written and it's the short book, but it has a lot of these paintings in it. And this is the painting. And um, I count 156 figures in it. In the bottom left-hand corner is the self-portrait of the painter, Luca Signorelli, with the blonde hair. Next to him in black is Fra, um, the Dominican um, painter, Fra Angelico because he was first assigned to paint this chapel. And he painted two pictures in it, but um, then he was called to Rome to do more painting. And it was only 50 years later that they assigned Luca Signorelli to paint the rest of the chapel. And this work is by Luca Signorelli. He also painted a, a wall of um, the resurrection of the flesh in heaven and a wall of, of hell. Uh, but this is called the Antichrist. Now, the figure obviously is a little bit to the right in the pink clothes. And um, there's a lot going on in this picture. Uh, some is called the black figures in the back people in costume, the black. One person called them the Ku Klux Klan in black. Someone else called them uh, ninja warriors. But um, look on the left. The people in the crowd listening to the Antichrist are beating up on one another. There's violence, and some are dead. And um, um, this is on the on the left there. And then in front of the, well, on the right of the Antichrist are a lot of people, and they're contemporary people. This was, painting was finished in 1503. So it was started in 1500, right at the time of the, of the um, semi-millennium. 500th year, not, not a millennium, would be a thousand years, but the Italians were very aware this the 500th year was a special year because it was like half a millennium moment. But people in the crowd on the right include Christopher Columbus. Now, Christopher Columbus sailed in 1492, right? And this was painted around 1500. So he was a very famous but absolutely contemporary man for the person who painted this. Also in the crowd is the son of a very corrupt pope who um, was a murderer and other things. And this um, pope was called the Antichrist, and so was his son. So the Antichrist archetype has been applied in history. It goes back, of course, to the original apocalypse. Now, Dennis, let's see the close-up of this uh, painting. 
It goes back to the original apocalypse, uh, of course, the last book of the Christian Bible. And uh, then that was book was written around the year 100 at the very time when Christians were literally being thrown to the lions in the in the um, Colosseum. And um, people applied it to Nero, the emperor at the time. So this is a close-up of the Antichrist that's from that picture you just saw. Notice that the devil is whispering in his ear. And it's interesting that the Arabic word for Satan is the whisperer, the whisperer. So that the word in, in, in Islam for Satan is the whisperer. Now notice that they share the same left arm, which is very interesting. So the, the struggle is not just about ideas, it's about deeds. In fact, the full title of the painting is the deeds of, of the Antichrist. And um, notice he has a hair problem, but this kind of, his hair is kind of like horns and he's pointing at himself. That is narcissism is intrinsic to the Antichrist. As is, of course, I, I love that beautiful prayer we started, but so too are lies. Satan is called the father of lies. And the, the Antichrist stands for everything that is not Christ. Okay, Dennis, you can show the next show up. Uh, so close up. Um, so the, the Antichrist is the Christian archetype for evil because it stands for everything that Christ is not, or if you will, it stands for the opposite of what Christ uh, stands for. And um, the pedestal that the Antichrist is standing on, you may remember, um, has a lot of goods in front of it, uh, a lot of um, expensive um, ornaments and so forth. Uh, so that represents the people who are trying to get something from the Antichrist who are giving a lot of their billions of dollars and so forth to the Antichrist. Now, let's show Hildegard of Bingen's painting of the Christ. Uh, it actually is over my shoulder, but I have this in the book too. I, I reproduce these books, these paintings in color. Because Hildegard of Bingen, saint and doctor of the church, 12th century abbess, and musician and genius and healer, wrote 10 books, including books on science and so forth. She painted the man in sapphire blue. She painted the Christ. And notice what the Christ is doing. The hands are like this. Now do this yourself. Put your hands at your side and then bring them up and do what the blue man is doing in this picture. Then do it again and feel what's going on in your body. When you lift your hands up and put your hands out like that, your whole, your whole chest is rising. So your heart chakra is putting itself to work. That's what passion is. Your heart into your hands. That's compassion. So this is a brilliant archetype from Hildegard of Bingen for compassion. And she teaches with this painting of hers, this Mandela, that the Christ, the blue man, the healing Christ is in all of us. We are all other Christs. When we are here to do this on earth, to heal and to teach and be compassionate, which is the name for God. The Jewish name for God is secret. And the secret name for God in Judaism is the compassionate one. Now, Jesus let this secret out of the bag in Luke 6. Be you compassionate is a creator in heaven is compassionate. But one thing that's special about this painting from Hildegard is that she declares this man, the Christ, is in all of us, urging us to compassion. And talk about urging. Look at his left knee. It's bent. See the left knee? It's bent. What does that mean? He's getting ready to run. She says we run into compassion. You're not passive about compassion. It comes from a passion, from a desire to assist others who are in trouble, who are hurting, who are suffering. And then also notice there's an aperture over his head, the seventh chakra, so that his, his energy, and of course the seventh chakra is a culmination of all the other chakras, the 
fire energy, the kundalini of all our chakras. If if the it, it, the, the message is kind of if there wasn't a hole for his seventh chakra to put his energy into the world, that he might he might blow up from his own energy, from his own love, from his own love, which we all prayed about this morning. Now this particular painting that the golden ropes she calls these the God the Father. And then the white color is her naming of God the Spirit. Breath is invisible. So white is the nearest thing to it for her. So this is also for her, a painting of the Trinity, the whole Trinity at work. The, this is her painting of the Christ, the compassionate one. So the Antichrist, who wants to not only be different from Christ, but displace the Christ, replace the Christ with something else. Not with truth, I am the truth, but with lies. Not with light, I am the light, but with darkness. Now, there's a short forward to my book by Carolyn Meese, who is a, a healer. And um, she begins by saying, if there is ever a time, a moment for examining the archetype of the Antichrist, it is now. And she says that the archetype is associated with demonic forces. Well, that was the painting from Luca Signorelli, 16th century, that continually wage war against the light of the divine. And uh, the Antichrist is an agent of chaos and turmoil. In fact, the Antichrist requires that people suffer so that he can appear to be the redeemer. And um, so this is what's going on here. And I believe we have a responsibility, just as Luca Signorelli took up responsibility in his day, painting the Pope of his day, painting the famous people of their day who were listening to, not necessarily voting for the Antichrist, but listening, who were present, because the Antichrist has a lot of powers. In fact, in that original painting, the fresco I showed you, I forgot to tell you, there's there's a resurrection and a healing going on in the background. And so we're being told that the Antichrist has a power to heal people and to attract people and to allure people. Now, Carl Jung wrote an essay on the archetype of the Antichrist. And he says in it, that the Antichrist has a special allurement and fascination for people. And of course, this fits perfectly in our time with social media and the algorithms and so forth that, that are being made by people behind the, the scenes to attract our attention and to, um, to in effect, uh, play on this allurement that is built in to the archetype of the of the Antichrist. And here is what Jung says about the importance of naming Jung, the Antichrist. He says, Jung warns us, quote, the less he is recognized, the more dangerous he is. So just like Luca Signorelli, just like Hildegard of Bingen, now we're going to turn to Hildegard of Bingen's painting of the Antichrist, because she painted an Antichrist in the 12th century. So Dennis, please show us that. And this Antichrist You'll be surprised. This is an X-rated painting by a nun. And I have a, a doctor of the church. There are only three other women who've been declared doctors of the church and, and a saint. But um, we have to look at, at evil directly. That's why we have artists who are inspired. Now, something happened here. It's kind of weird. Yeah, let's bring back the full picture there. It'll come. Um, there are three boxes in this painting, three stories that she's telling us. She didn't have video, <laughs> but this is, is based a lot on the book of the apocalypse. She's borrowing the format, if you will, from there. So on the upper left-hand corner are five animals, and she identifies them explicitly, uh, what they stand for, and what she, <laughs> in effect, what she's trying to paint. Um, so there's a whole chapter here uh, on um, Hildegard's painting here, the Antichrist as patriarchy, I call it. And she says the fiery dog stands for humans who bite at their own condition and do not burn with justice. The reddish lion stands for warlike men who wage wars without considering God's judgment. The pale horse stands for those who put luxury living and their own selfish pleasure toward the performance 
worthwhile acts. Black pig stands for rulers who create sadness in themselves and their subjects. And the wolf stands for those who rob others. The black rope, now notice each of these animals is biting on a black rope. These represent the darkness that stretches out many injustices, she says. So this for her is, a, is the naming of the Antichrist because she calls this whole painting the Antichrist. That these energies of luxury living and so forth, greed and the rest, these are all the energies that, that uh, circle around the Antichrist. Now the upper right-hand corner is the Christ. And she says he is a young man. Notice he's showing the peace sign. <laughs> Although I'm not sure this was the peace sign in the 12th century, but it is for us. But she says that the two stands for, for Enoch and Elijah, the Jewish prophets. Um, and that's interesting because Luca Signorelli, who did his painting four centuries after Kildegard, also has those two prophets in his painting, and they are being beheaded by the Antichrist. But um, the Christ is standing on, on two walls, the wall, she says, of knowledge and the wall of mirror knowledge, which is the realization that we are all other Christs, that we are mirrors of God, images of God. In Hebrew, the word is shalem. And it is the archetype in Hebrew for what we'd call the cosmic Christ, in Christianity, or what the Buddhists would call the Buddha nature in Buddhism, that we are all other Christ, we are all other Buddhas, we are all other images of God. So this is the energy that the Christ brings. And she says, the Christ is a young man, the son of man, who is a beginning of justice, who watches over the strength of the union of mirror knowledge and human work. And the Elijah is a symbol of John the Baptist prophet, precursor of Christ, and these prophets carry the banner of the justice of God and put the devil to flight. Christ is a very strong warrior and will break the head of injustice. So that's the, the pitting of the warrior Christ against the energies of the Antichrist. Then in the bottom of the picture, you, it's a full half bottom, not a quarter, and you have Mother Church on the left with a very big penis. And um, if you look carefully at this penis, it's got red eyes and ugly teeth. And then, see, because this is like, like a video she's painting here. It's, there's movement. Then this penis comes flying. Um, and um, she identifies this object that looks to me like a B-1 bomber with the red eyes and the iron teeth, she says, she identifies it as feces, BS in colloquial language, bull, S-H-X-T. This is what comes from the, arc, the Antichrist, because she says the Antichrist has taken over the church and the red thighs are blood that are bleeding from the church because the Antichrist has taken over the church. Now, this is a part of the Antichrist. It goes where the power is. And in the 12th century, the power was the church. And Hildegard knew it. She was inside it. She was an abbess. But she's naming it, that the Antichrist takes over powers, such as the Supreme Court. It goes to where the power is. It goes, it's like Opus Dei. It goes to the Supreme Court. It'll go to the presidency. It'll go to Congress if you let it. And she says this about this ugly head. It is a monstrous and very black head appeared, having fiery eyes, ears like the ears of an ass, and nostrils and mouth like the nostrils and mouth of a lion, crunching with a great jaw, cutting horribly like horrible iron teeth. It moves with monstrous ugliness. It spreads a foul odor on the mountain and tears the institutions of the church to pieces with the crudest greediness and causes the bloody wounds on mother church. This is the antichrist, she says, the son of injustice, the cursed one of the cursed ones. And it 
it happens because people are staggering and are lukewarm in in studying the divine scriptures. And then she addresses the monster, second person. Oh, you cave of injustice. Your works seek the pit of hell. You will live absorbed in your gluttony there. And that hellish place will vomit forth stink. The world will recognize in this stench, the bitterness of death in the destroyer of destructions. So she's furious. She's raging. She's angry. She's in touch with her third chakra. She's not pretending that there isn't some serious evil going on. She's naming the evil, folks. And that's what I'm doing in this book entitled Trump and the Mega Movement as Antichrist, a handbook for the 2024 election. I dedicate the book to young leaders. I want to read you my dedication. I dedicate this book to the young leaders of the world and all those who are not in denial about climate change and recognize our earth as sacred and worth saving. Donald Trump has said in a speech he gave this year to the heads of fossil fuel companies that if they gave him a billion dollars, he would deconstruct as many laws as he could that are trying to protect the environment. We have the exact words from him. So those who think that the earth is not sacred belong to the energy, the antichrist. And Trump also said, quote, climate change is a hoax, unquote. I also dedicate to those who believe that a government of the people, by the people, and for the people is an aspiration worth struggling to preserve and improve upon. In other words, the war against democracy, trying to replace democracy with autocracy, with authoritarianism, like happened in Hungary, and Hungary is being praised by Mega in our time, the this um, head of Hungary who is uh, a um, an autocrat entirely, and of course, praising people like Putin and others. And I dedicate it to, to all those who prefer biophilia to necrophilia. Jesus said, I come that I have life and life in abundance. Ernest um, Block, no, not Ernest Block, um, Eric Fromm, the great psychologist, said that necrophilia grows when biophilia is stunted. So necrophilia, the love of death, is his definition of evil. And it grows. It's allowed to grow when our love of life, when biophilia is stunted. And 95% of the words that come out of the, one of these presidential candidates in our time are words of put down of other people, put down of immigrants, calling them venom and so forth. It's not biophilia that is being spread. It's necrophilia. And of course, the threats to lock up his political opponents uh, in prison, which he's repeated several times this week. So those who prefer biophilia to necrophilia, joy to grievance, love to hate, and justice to greed, that guarantees injustice. That's who I dedicated the book to. Now, one thing that amazed me when I started researching this book was that Sigmund Freud, came upon the same fresco that I came upon. And it changed his life. My first chapter in the book is on Sigmund Freud, which absolutely surprises me because I'm not Freudian, although I respect the fact that he had a, a, a talent for talent, for finding talent, because the two psychologists I do respect were, were disciples of his who broke with him, but he he plucked them out of the crowd and, and uh, they were in his original circle. And that is, Otto Rank, R-A-N-K, and Carl Jung. And, um, but that Freud begins the, the book because Freud saw the same fresco I did and he too had a spiritual experience. So much so that he went back three times to Orvieto to study this painting. And he called this painting, quote, the finest painting I have ever seen. And um, there's a whole book written about Freud's trip to Orvieto. And it's a beautiful book, a powerful book, beautifully written and researched by an art historian from Yale who is a Freudian. He underwent Freudian analysis and the rest. 
And he's Jewish, like Freud was, and he understands him profoundly. But it's a brilliantly researched and written book. But that's a stunning that Freud, I mean, Freud didn't like religion. He wrote five books against religion. He himself is an atheist. He represents a secular left-wing atheism, if you will, even of our time. But that's why I bring him in, because the archetype of the Antichrist has been used by the right wing, by fundamentalism for many, many years. I am the first one I know from the tradition of the common good that has, what I've done is I've taken it back. I've seized the archetype back from the right wing and I'm applying it to a politics of compassion. And the very first page of my book is quotes from Thomas Aquinas about tyrants, how tyrants prefer, they're more afraid of good people than of bad people. That's just one of his insights. He has so many insights about tyrants. So the fact that Freud went back to Orvieto on three different occasions to study this painting. Now, Michelangelo also studied the paintings of this chapel. He spent three months there doing it. But the thing with Freud is this, and one of the interesting tidbits that this researcher brought out about Freud is this. When he was a young man, before he, psychologists know that, when he was a young man, he went to Paris and he tell, told someone in a letter, we have a letter, that his friends, when they had free time, would go to the parks or go to the museums and stuff. He, what he chose to do was to go to the top of Notre Dame Cathedral and hang out with the gargoyles and the demons. The statues of the demons and gargoyles. I think that is so revelatory of, of Freud. His whole life, that was his vocation, wasn't it? He was trying to examine the id, you know, the unconscious, what, what dictates things to us that make us less than good, you know? So I, for me, that was an incredible story to hear. That's in this first chapter too. But um, the point is that um, the, those who know Freud say that this painting utterly changed him. It was a bomb. That's the word they use, a bomb in his life. And his father had died that year. So his father's death was on his mind. And also a patient of his um, uh, had um, committed suicide. So that was on his mind. So Eros and Thanatos, death and violence were on his mind. And of course, anti-Semitism. And he had this big question of whether Jewish men were, were male enough or masculine enough, because he felt that his father told him a story when he was eight years old. His father said he's walking down the street in Vienna, and there's a lot of anti-Semitism in the 19th century in Vienna. And this guy took his father's hat and threw it in the street. And Freud asked his father, what did you do, daddy? And his father said, I went on the street and picked up my hat. That story stayed with Freud forever. And he had this question in his whole mind, that Jewish men have to be more masculine. And that's what he liked. That's about the paintings, because the Signorelli's paintings of hell and heaven and the rest of the body have these incredible naked men with incredible bodies, uh, men who work out a lot. And that too was an attraction to, to Freud because he was always fighting to find stronger father figure in his life. But he realized it was not the Antichrist. And by the way, I have an appendix to my book entitled Mega's Precious Manhood, Precarious Manhood versus Authentic Masculinity that, um, uh, that the issue of masculinity is very strong in the in this uh, political campaign on the part of Mega, and um, uh, that derives, I think, from a, a weakness. Bullies, bullies are invariably um, fearful people, and they always need to be surrounded by a group. They always need a group around them to defend them, and that is part of the of the energy. So I have a chapter on Mega. And I begin up by saying, some people say mega means make America great again. I think it means make America grotesque again. And I go through some American history, the grotesqueness of slavery, the grotesqueness of the genocide toward the indigenous people, 
the grotesqueness of the racism toward Indians, which resulted in the 19th century. There were 30 million buffalo in, in middle America, and the white people went after the buffalo because they knew the Indians depended on the buffalo. And the result was that there were 500 buffalo left, from 30 million to 500. That is grotesque. The denial of climate change is grotesque. The misogyny of telling us that male politicians have the right to tell women what they must do with their bodies, this I think is grotesque, etc. So uh, I also have a chapter on 18 um, dimensions or expressions, signs of the Antichrist in uh, this election and such things as Project 2025, which is a prelude to fascism, is explicitly laid out there. All this is, is part of the Antichrist. And the reason I chose 18 was six plus six plus six. So um, I'll end here, and um, I hope that, um, that uh, we can have some discussion. I, I do wanna say that um, uh, our ancestors, like Hildegard, Saint Hildegard, Doctor of the Church, Hildegard, the writer of the Book of Revelations and Apocalypse, and uh, Lucas Signorelli, and the Protestant reformers in the 16th century. Luther picked up the archetype of the Antichrist, applied it first to the Curia in Rome and then to the Pope. And for 25 years, he employed that term right after the day he died. And then Zwingli and Calvin and John Knox picked up on it too. So there is a tradition about applying this archetype. And it's not about shooting down any individual, but it is about recognizing that evil happens, evil is among us, evil is smart, it will hide out, it has many powers, it can heal, it can attract people, it can raise people from the dead even. But uh, we have to realize what Paul said, that our struggle is against powers and principalities. And I think there are many powers of darkness in the world today, not just in America. Uh, these efforts at bringing fascism back and um, and denouncing uh, democracy on the one hand, but also uh, denying climate change on the other, even as it is beginning to swallow us up with hurricanes rising of the seas and the rest. So Matthew, tell us how, how we can get the book. I, I think uh, Dennis just actually Dennis. put a link here in the comments. So what what do they go to the to your website and they can get the, the PDF there? Yeah, MatthewFast.org, they could get it there. Yeah, I was also on a program recently with Tom Hartman talking about this because he did a brilliant article on asking, his title of his article was, Is Donald Trump going to reveal himself as the Antichrist? And he published it the morning of the debate of Harris versus Trump. And so I followed up and I, I contacted him and then he interviewed me. So we have that 12 minute interview too um, that's available online. But um, uh, this is, um, yeah, you can get it from MatthewFox.org. Dennis, do you have any other place? Or you can get it from uh, Amazon. It's on Amazon, the book. Beautiful. It's called uh, Trump and the Mega Movement as Antichrist. And I want to, if I could say this, one thing, one point I made in the book is that Americans don't want to think about evil and talk about it. First of all, because most of our ancestors fled from Europe, the evil of Europe, whether it was famine and poverty like the Irish, or whether it was religious oppression or wars and the rest, or they just wanted a better life. So most Americans came here looking forward, not back. And then a second reason we have trouble talking about evil is that I think religion has failed us in the West is so oversold sin. And sin is not evil. Sin is the door to evil. <clears throat> I learned this from Buck Ghost Horse, a Lakota teacher. He said to me one day, in our tradition, fear is a door in the heart that lets evil spirits in. Now notice, the, and so he said, all prayer is strengthening the heart so that the door is shut to evil spirits, open to good spirits, shut to evil spirits. So notice it is between the door, that's the sin part. Fear is sin, but, um, but evil comes in if we yield to that. And I think that applies to each of the chakras. Um, gluttony, the throat chakra, 
is is not just about eating too much. It's also consumer. It's consumer capitalism. And if we don't critique that and don't have a door to put limits on that, then we literally eat up the earth, which is what we've done. You go through each of the seven chapters, as I do in my other book. Uh, I've written three books on evil. This is the third. My first one is a very big one. And it, it goes through the seven chapters and the seven capital sins. And it, it demonstrates these kind of things. So we need to talk about evil. And especially exactly. now, because our species is facing extinction. Well, Matthew, and thank you so much. We are going to go ahead and stop the recording now. However, if if Matt, if you would like to stay in the room and if anyone else would like to continue this discussion, uh, you're all very welcome to. We'll just keep the, the, the room open. But for those of you who are watching this on YouTube, we are so grateful you could join us. Um, and no matter where you land on either side of this field, know that the key is love. You know, you shall know a tree by the fruit that it bears. And you could look at a tree and you decide. I'm not trying to tell you. Matthew's not trying to tell you. You decide what tree is bearing good fruit, the fruit of love, the fruit of harmony and joining rather than distracting and all the other things that we see today. So it's your decision. And thank you so much for being open and, and listening to this very, very interesting talk. So we're going to stop the recording now, and anyone who wants to stay in the room, please do so.